So what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be drawing this eye right here and so that we don't have to worry about any kind of like copyright issues or anything. This is a an eye from a Rembrandt painting. So um, I just thought it had really nice lighting and it had examples of what I'm going to be going over. So I'm going to be drawing that but um, I'm not worried if it looks exactly like this Rembrandt's eye. A lot of times I'll like do a demonstration of an eye and I just kind of do it for my imagination so it's a little hit or miss if it looks uh, right. But um, you know I just want to give some examples of how to draw an eye in terms of shading but I'm also going to talk about the anatomy of the eye so that will explain why the eye is shaded in a certain way and this can really help you if you're trying to, you know, just start to draw things out of your imagination, kind of knowing the structure of an eye so that you can understand how it would look in different lighting situations can be really helpful. So let's talk about what you need. Obviously, I have um, a photo here, so you could use this image if you're drawing along with me. You can just kind of prop your phone or your computer or, what up, or whatever um, up next to what you're drawing. You could use a totally different image of an eye or you can just kind of look at what I'm sketching and go off of that. In terms of materials, if you have a graphite pencil and some paper, you have everything that you need. What's even better is if you have some toned paper and I'm using some toned paper here. There, that's gonna be a better view. I can't really put my head in there totally, but um, I have just some gray construction paper. So if you have gray construction paper or brown or tan or even blue or purple, that can be really fun. Um, but construction paper is really nice to draw on. And then all I'm gonna be using today is some charcoal pencils and some white charcoal, that one there. So nothing really fancy and if you don't have Charcoal pencils, you could also use colored pencils. So black and white colored pencils will work totally perfectly for this. Uh, pastel pencils, probably crayons would work too, if you have some crayons. And if anybody uses crayons, I would like to see that. So yeah, um, I guess let's go ahead and get started with this drawing. Almost up to 40 people now, awesome. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, yes, look how sharp those pencils are. Go and watch my pencil sharpener video. Um, if you haven't seen it already, I've got my pencil sharpener here with me. So I might be using that part way through. We'll see. Hi, Jessica. Good to see you here. All right. So to start, I'm going to do what I always tell my students totally not to do. And I'm just going to sketch approximately the top shape of the eyelid okay now I always tell my students not to do that I always first have them do like a block in for all the shadow shapes on the outside and I do for the most part think that's the right way to go but I want to talk about some anatomy today so I'm just gonna start off with that and uh, can you guys hear me okay let me know that you can hear me okay then um, more shock and awe for anybody who's actually taken classes with me. I'm going to draw an approximate iris shape, iris, iris shape. <laughs> and I'm just going to kind of leave it at that. I'm assuming that I'm going to move that around a little bit. But I want to talk about the structure of the eye and a little bit of the shading as I go along. Hi, Roxy. Nice to meet you. Is that from Palmyra, New York or Palmyra somewhere else? Okay, so I wanna talk about the iris a little bit. The iris, I'm gonna draw an eyeball over here and I'm gonna draw kind of a sideways view and then let me see if I feel like you guys can see that. You can see that okay, right? Um, so the iris actually dips inwards into the eye. If we're looking at the eye from a sideways view, the iris does not follow the outside of the eyeball. It's not round, it dips in. So it's kind of like a cup, right? 
So what that means is if the lighting is from above and to the side, which most of the time when we're looking at somebody, oh, Palmyra, Missouri, interesting. There is a Palmyra, New York. Uh, so in this, um, in this image here, the light is coming from this way. So I'm gonna draw my little light bulb here. So the light is coming from above and kind of to the side. And what that means is since the iris tilts in, it's going to be shaded at the top because it's angled inwards and it's going to be light at the bottom. So since it's kind of coming from an angle, it's going to be lighter down here and darker up at the top. Okay, so that's what's going on with the iris. Now also, because we have an eyelid here, the eyelid has a depth to it and it's casting a shadow onto the eyeball. So we need to get that shadow in there. Now, since this iris is dipped in, the cast shadow on it goes in even a little bit further, okay? So it's kind of like this. I'm gonna look and I'm gonna see if that shows up. Yeah, that shows up, all right. So the, the distance from the eyelid to the iris is greater because if the eyelid is out here, see there's more space from there to there than on the white of the eyeball. If that makes sense, let me know in the comments so that I can know that what I'm saying is coming through. All right, cool. Now the other thing that's happening in here, um, in the iris, is there's a cornea. So the cornea pushes outwards more than this sphere as the iris dips inwards. So that's making even more distance here because that cornea is pushing out the eyelid. And I like to explain that's why we know where somebody is looking, like if their eyes are moving when they're asleep because that cornea pushes out and we can see that moving around. So that's also one of the reasons that there's a different sort of curve in this part of the eyelid there. Um, so what that means is that if the light is coming from above, you've got shadow here on this part of the iris, light here on that part of the iris, and then a highlight over the darkest part of the iris. So I'm gonna start that highlight that's right in there, just kind of sort of make a guess as to where it is. And this can all be adjusted later. I always say don't get married to these early marks. Hi, Carol. Yeah, you know, I would really like to um, get this closer, but unfortunately, there's no way to zoom in my camera here. And, and the camera's like right on my shoulder like right on my shoulder. So um, I can afterwards go ahead and give that a shot and try and zoom in, but unfortunately I can't uh, zoom in anymore for just the general thing that we're doing here. It's kind of a bummer. I was hoping I was gonna be able to use my fancy pants camera, but I have to use my phone for Facebook Live. Hi, Jessica. All right, I'm just going to kind of hazily throw in this uh, pupil here. I recommend everything that you do in these beginning stages, just keep it really kind of like hazy. Don't overcommit to anything. Um, notice that in everything that I've done, I've kind of used sketchy marks. So I've used marks like this when I drew this circle. I didn't really get in there and make a harsh outline. Those harsh outlines can come later. So for now, let's just keep it kind of fuzzy and that means that you can change your mind, which is really nice. All right, 
So let's start to move outwards now. We can come back to more information in the iris and pupil and the highlight and everything later. But something that we sometimes forget is that this whole thing is round, like the whole eyeball is round. And often we want to keep the whites of the eyes really crisp and white when really there's a lot of shadow. So if you look in this image, all these values are actually pretty dark, including some of the shading up here. And that's just because the whole eyeball itself is round. So let's go ahead and make some shading on this side. And as I'm doing that, I'm going to shade the iris overall a little bit darker too, just to make kind of like some room for that white of the eye to get darker. And I'm going to do a little bit of shading over here as well. So instead of trying to outline this bottom edge of the eyelid, which I can basically guarantee you if I draw a curved line down there, I'm, I'm going to get it wrong. It's not going to be totally right. So instead, I'm going to kind of like creep up on all the edges. Um, I'm going to just do a little bit of shading here. That way, if it's not totally in the right spot, it's really easy to adjust later. Also, we have symbols for everything about the eye. So we have like this symbol of a football shape with a circle in it for the eye. And it's really hard for us to get away from that sometimes. So one of the ways that I try and get away from drawing that football and circle shape for the eye is instead of focusing on the football and the circle, I focus on the little shapes of the whites of the eye, or I focus on the shadows that are on the outside that are a little bit more abstract. And that helps me not get caught up in what I think I already know about the shape of the eye. And then even though there is a tear duct in there that I could go and start to define, I'm going to shift my focus because it's a pretty small thing right here. It's smaller than the iris, it's smaller than the whites of the eye, and it's smaller than the eyelids and this little crevice that occurs before you get to the brow and the bridge of the nose. So I'm going to work on all of that before really committing to anything going on in there. So as I come up here, I'm just gonna kind of look at the space from this darkest spot to this crease. We'll lay it around there. So how are you guys doing? I wanna know too, is anybody drawing along with me or no? Hi Sarah, how you doing? So I looked at this distance and now I'm trying to estimate about how far from this edge of the eye to that outside crease in the eye there. And the same thing here, there's kind of this widest point just outside of the iris. I'm gonna estimate something like that before it turns back downwards. <laughs> hey Lydia, well do your best. It'll be replayed, and I think that you can rewind too if I'm going a little fast. If I'm going fast, let me know. I get excited sometimes. Helen, I'm sure it's drawing. Thank you for joining. 
Jessica, if you want to know about my sharpener, because these uh, pencil points are really super long, go and look on my page, Lacey Lewis or Lacey Lewis School of Realist Art, because I just posted a review of the sharpener that I'm using. It's an F matte sharpener. Hi, Laura. Good to see you. Hey, Julia. Awesome. I'm glad that you're drawing along. And Stephanie. Awesome. Oh my gosh, Sarah, your first drawing class ever. That's crazy. <laughs> Natalie, you'll get there, I'm sure. Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, this is exciting. I'm glad to hear so many of you are drawing along with me. That's so much fun. And definitely I want to find somewhere that we can all put our drawings together because I would love to see them afterwards. All right, so I notice over here, this side is closer, right? And I don't think my curve on this is totally right, but it'll get there. We don't need everything to be perfect right from the beginning. I don't even need everything to be perfect at the end to tell the truth. So, okay. I can see that this lid is not quite the same, but it's okay. It's a good first estimate, I think. I'm going to kind of look at the distance from here to here because I think my kind of preliminary tear duct shape will need to be a little bit shorter and that'll bring kind of the edge of this light on that skin that wraps around the tear duct out there. All right. Something like that. Hi, Jill. Good to see you. Hello, Holly. All right, so let's get some shading going in here and moving outwards as well. So just as the eyeball itself is round, and now I'm going to sketch. Let me make sure that's still on there. Yep. I'm going to sketch another circle. And let's picture this being the eyeball from above, right? So this is a person looking that way, looking down, um, or it's the eyeball of a person looking down. So the cornea, like I said, it kind of pokes out, right? Plus the eyeball is round. And then somewhere around here, there's the eye socket, okay? So maybe the eyeball doesn't always stick out that much, but somewhat. So the skin on the eye, usually the tear duct is somewhere near the bone around the outside of the eye socket, but then the skin of the eyelid wraps around the eye and that cornea. So it kind of pushes out that way. That means it needs shading going this way. So we're going to need to shade this eyelid here to make it look round that way. And we're also gonna shade it to look round this way because on this view, that eyelid goes around the top and the bottom of the eyeball, right? Oh my God, Jill, I wanna see the crayon. That's gonna be great. <laughs> All right, so once again, the light is coming from up here, which means that this section of the eyelid gets more light, and this section especially gets less light, okay? So somewhere around here, there's a terminator, and I want you to notice, it is unfortunate that I can't zoom in, but hopefully you'll be able to see this. Actually, I'll draw it with the white. There is a terminator edge, and the terminator is just the edge of the shadow, where the shadow begins and the light ends. It's kind of like this, okay? And the reason that it's curved like that is because there is a thickness to this skin, and it's curving around the eyeball. So rather than having a super straight up and down terminator edge on this, we want it to kind of come out and then go in this way in order to show that shape of the eyelid. So 
I'm gonna make it darker in here in the crease, but I'm not necessarily trying to make a clean line because it really isn't a clean line. And then I'm just kind of putting a coating of shading there. Maybe it would have been nice if I didn't outline that so heavily there. So I'm just gonna wipe at it some, but it'll be fine. I say that a lot, it'll be fine. I'm gonna drag a little bit of the shading out. Kind of create a half tone here. And then it gets really pretty dark in that area, so I'm gonna let it get darker in that area too. Hey Natalie, yes, if you don't have white charcoal or a gel pen, uh, you could use an eraser. Some materials erase better than others, uh, but you can use that. And also if you have like a white colored pencil that could work, especially if you do have the toned paper. And um, Angie just mentioned if anybody would like to make a donation to the art house um, with this at your art house series that you should go to their page and go ahead and make a donation. So if you're finding this useful today, I highly recommend, you know, no matter how much it is, if you can go over and make a donation to Inner Urban Art House, they are doing some really amazing things right now for artists and for everybody kind of stuck at home. So I really appreciate their help with this and I hope that you will consider if you're able going over and making a donation and there is a link in the comments for that. All right so I've got a little bit of half tone going on this lid and if you notice there's a little bit of kind of a half tone or a shadow continuing along the edge of the eyelid because our eyelids do have a thickness they're not really like a thin sheet of paper that goes over the eye. They stand out in front of the eye. And this particular eye doesn't appear to have any eyelashes, but just as a side note, there's actually a lot of space between the eyelashes and the eyeball. So if I'm over here on my little illustration, the eyelashes would come out here. So there's all this space in between. And if you're a makeup person, this is called the waterline. Uh, I don't know if it's called the waterline anywhere outside of makeup, but um, it's kind of like that little wet part of your eye um, before like the regular face skin begins. So that's on both the bottom and the top. We just often don't see it on the top because the eyelashes on the top go down before they go up. So anyway, there's a little bit of a turn there and a thickness to the eyelid, so I'm going to shade that in a little bit too. Brooke, let me know how the white colored pencil works out for you. I've found that often the paper really makes a difference. I've tried colored pencils on the Canson Me Tiente's paper and it works really nice, but if the paper is too smooth, sometimes it just doesn't pick up the colored pencil quite enough. Now that I've got that in, just gonna put a tiny little bit of shading in here. So I'm just using really light marks there because I don't want it to get as dark as this shadow out here. And I know I have not yet, except for that highlight, I haven't come in with the white yet, but we will. All right, so I'm gonna keep moving upwards before I move downwards. There's this really nice <laughs> big uh, shadow here, and I just feel like these shadow shapes and kind of making a home for the eye are really important. And to me, uh, this shadow shape looks like a like a hand in an oven mitt. It's like ah rah rah rah. 
I feel like sometimes you get bonus points when you can make these shadow shapes into like different kind of animated characters. It can kind of help you draw them if you look at them that way instead of just looking at them like what they are. So here's the shape I see there. This is kind of a soft pencil. I guess it'll be fine. And I just want to eyeball some distances. So, you know, normally I teach my students this elaborate kind of block-in situation, but when I'm kind of winging it, I just keep trying to look at distances in different places and estimate them, and then later on come back and decide if I'm right or not. So it's like, I think from here to here is about that far. I think from there to the bottom is probably about this far. And if I go from this uh, sort of wide point that I looked at before, maybe a little bigger, something like that. And then this part here, kind of the end of the shadow, it's not exactly in the middle of the eye, it's a little over, but it's somewhere in between the middle of the eye and that highlight, right kind of in between so if I go here and then up, it'll be there, but maybe a little lower. So that's kind of how I try and work these things out in my head. But I keep it pretty fuzzy because I'm going to change my mind. I always change my mind. Some people call it mistakes. I just call it changing my mind. <laughs> Nothing is a mistake when you allow yourself to change your mind. There's my little oven mitt hand. Now I'm just going to fill that in because it's a big shadow shape. that's filled in I am gonna just try and emphasize a few parts of it where it's darker and now I'm going to just sort of drag out a little bit of the half tone that way it it stops looking totally like an oven mitt hand and can start to look a little bit more like an eye socket. Well, something you might notice is when I am filling in a shadow, so if I've got a shape like this that I'm trying to fill in with shadow, I make my marks back and forth. So I keep the pencil in contact with the paper and I just move back and forth. And the reason is that when I do that, moving back and forth, it makes a closed shape, you know? And so each side of that shading is kind of even and filled in. But then when I switch over and I'm trying to make a transition, like this shape I want to be pretty solid, but then I want it to gradually fade off afterwards, I don't move my pencil back and forth anymore. I do something going in one direction. And the reason that I do that is especially when you layer it a couple times, you end up with one side being dark and one side being light, so it makes a transition over the whole thing instead of a filled in block. So that's something to keep in mind too, because if I shaded back and forth along all these transitions, I'm just gonna end up with a bunch of stripes. 
and that doesn't look round. It makes things look kind of chiseled. Hey, Julia, thank you. Um, you know, I mostly like to use medium and hard charcoal pencils, but, <laughs> but I just realized that these new pencils that I bought, a lot of the medium ones are behaving like hard pencils. So actually, I might, I might even be able to show the difference there. Here's a medium pencil that I feel like is acting like a hard pencil. Here's a hard pencil. And I think this one is one of my old medium pencils. So I'm not sure if you can see the difference, but to me, these are thin and kind of light and this one is thicker and darker. So I don't know what's up, but my entire recent box of medium pencils is like this. So I usually like medium and hard. And the reason that I don't usually get soft pencils is because they don't function very well in an electric sharpener, which I need an electric sharpener. Also, I gotta take a little coffee break here. Um, Julia, according to this on the charcoal pencils, the medium is 2B. And I would say when, you know, I don't know the conversion to all other charcoal pencils because um, there are just so many brands that I don't use and I feel like it's not very standardized. But in general, when I'm working in graphite, I consider 2B, I consider 2B to be kind of a general pencil like it's good for doing shading and line work for the most part whereas if you get a really hard pencil like a 4H it's really not good for shading and if you get something like an 8B it's super soft it's not good for line work so I feel like a 2B graphite pencil is just really a good overall pencil and um, I would say the same for these medium generals charcoal pencils uh, but like I said they're they're acting like HBs right now HB are the hard pencils and I am seeing that for some reason my charger isn't working so give me one second so I can plug in and make sure that my phone doesn't die It is always helpful if you plug in your extension cord. All right, good, I'm charging. Did I mention I dropped my pencils? All right. How's everybody doing out there? continue with this shading around the outside. And I'm going to start to get this bit of shading and then I'm going to circle around down this way and down this way as well. So I'm going to circle all the way through before I really get into any detail in here in the eye. I want to make sure that the home for my eye and everything is set. Now I do find eye sockets to be really pretty interesting and since we're all at home together, I do recommend if you have um, either yourself or loved ones or dogs, I'm always like palpating my dog's face, it can actually be really nice to touch 
the outside of your own or somebody else's eye socket so that you can really feel where the bone on the eye socket ends. Because so it's kind of interesting. Like I would say on her, it's out here on this person. Um, but you can actually feel the edge of the bone and it's kind of interesting once you start to feel that and you realize how the eye sits in there, it can just be really helpful. But here we start to go back into the temple, right? So that gets pretty dark. Brooke, that's good to hear, awesome. All right, let's come back out to this outside corner in the eye, okay? I'm gonna switch back to this hard medium pencil. So I'm just trying to refine the outside corner of this eye so that we can start to get this shading under here, underneath the bottom eyelid. So I'm thinking that has this kind of a shape and it kind of also connects to this outside of the eyelid here. All right, there's some specific shapes going on here with the wrinkles under the eye and everything, but like everything else, we'll kind of creep up on it, okay? So now what I'm gonna do is just lightly make marks to come around underneath the eye and start to sort of like hint at those wrinkles and that shading under there, but you know, again, just kind of keep it hazy. Hey Don, what, um, what charcoal paper are you using? Like what brand? I find, uh, for example, the Mi Tientes brand or it's Canson brand Mi Tientes paper. I find that the correct side of it is way too rough. Like I can't see pencil marks and I don't like that. I like to see my pencil marks, but the back side of the paper is like perfect. And this other bit here that's a bit lower. I want to kind of map out a little bit first, make sure that I like the placement. It's going to be pointing kind of in there. Okay. So again, I'm just going to shade that really kind of gently, like just a little bit. Oh yeah, if, if it's the Canson Mitientes, they might make another paper that's, there's some paper that's texture on both sides and it's annoying, but they make one, the Mitientes, it's like relatively smooth on the back side. That sounds weird. <laughs> okay, I'm going to pull out some of this shading here and then I think we're gonna start to get to some fun stuff with white highlights and some details. Again, I'm doing those marks going in one direction here so that I'm kind of making a transition. And you can see in the reference that there's a darker area down here because there's a nostril that's gonna happen, but I'm not going to include that here in my drawing. I'm just gonna let it sort of fade off one of these, I should do a discussion of mark directions. I think that would be fun. But I am making marks going in various directions here. I'll leave it at that for now. that along a little bit. I'm just kind of looking everywhere that maybe I just need to transition from a shadow into a light a little bit more. Like anywhere that my shadow edges are a little too harsh and obvious, that's what I'm doing. 
And then there is like right between here and here, this section is just a little bit lighter. So I'm going to darken this area. A lot of the time, if we need something to look lighter, just by darkening an area next to it, that'll work better sometimes than erasing. All right. So I feel that's a pretty good spot to get to. I'm trying to erase that little arrow there. Maybe this one here. Let's get rid of some of my doodles. Let's be serious. Or not. Oh, Brittany, that's interesting. Charcoal powder. Well, um, I guess it depends on how you would be applying the charcoal powder. Um, I haven't worked with it too much myself, but I imagine you can just do different directions um, if you're using something to apply it. But otherwise, just try and... Um, you know, make, I mean, you want a smooth transition in some areas, and then in some areas, like at the Terminator, you want it to be clear. So, sorry, I feel like I'm not totally answering your question just because I'm not too experienced with charcoal powder, but if you can post your work somewhere too, that might help, and then I might be able to give some suggestions based off of that. I think we'll find somewhere on the Inner Urban Art House page or the Lacey Lewis page, something where we can kind of share some of that work. So let's come back in to the iris here, right? Where we started. So I think my iris that I started off with is a bit too long. So I'm gonna redefine that. So that's a lovely part if you leave things a bit fuzzy, you can always come back and adjust it. And since I left it fuzzy, I don't necessarily need to erase there because I can put some white charcoal over the top if I want. Now, if you're working on white paper, you'll probably have to erase, but if you made your marks really light, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. And keep it a little darker at the outside of the iris and like I said earlier because of that dip in of the iris and because of the eyelid casting a shadow into the iris I'm gonna make it really really dark up here at the top Sometimes if you want to make this highlight seem even brighter, make it really dark next to it. It's kind of interesting that typically, just because of the structure of the iris and the cornea, that that highlight usually ends up over the darkest part of the eye. So that's kind of a cool thing. So emphasize that, and the darker that you make the surroundings of that highlight, the more it's going to seem to pop and the more depth that there will seem like is between that cornea and the iris. There, I kind of like that. Really, really dark like that. I'm going to make some marks kind of radiating outwards because there are usually these kind of textured marks inside of an iris, but I don't need to go overboard with it. Just a little bit of a hint will be fine. Oh, interesting, a paintbrush. Yeah, go ahead and, you know, especially if you can post it online. The nice thing about when you post things online is everybody can, like, get some inspiration. Uh, so this is for... For Brittany, if you can post it online, that way everybody can see the feedback and everybody can benefit from it, that would be great. Um, but I don't remember what I was thinking now. But yeah, a paintbrush would be, would be interesting and definitely you can do some similar things with the mark using a paintbrush. Thanks, Don, I'll see you later. Thanks for joining. I know we're probably getting close to the end here. 
So let me go ahead for all you people who have some white. Woo! Let's put in some white. So this middle of the eyelid is going to be lightest because it's closest to and facing light. And again, I'm making these marks going in one direction because I do want the middle part to be the lightest and then I want it to kind of fade outwards from there. I'm going to restate just this part of the highlight. I find if, if you just make the highlight simply like a dot or something, right, or just a, a hard edge all the way around, it, it just looks kind of fake. So I like having it brighter on one side and duller and a little faded on the other side. I don't want this to appear too flat over here, so I'm just going to give it a little bit of highlight as well. Not too much, just a little. And then let's come into the white of the eye. Over here really doesn't need any white because it's all in shadow. Thanks, Sherry. Thanks for joining. But I am going to put a little bit of white over in this area. Okay, so not everywhere. This is just one of those things like we know the white of the eye is white, so sometimes we want to just put a ton of white in there, but it can really make people look psychotic. <laughs> it, make, it can make people look very, very surprised because if the entire white of the eye is getting light, usually people's eyes are opened like a lot, like they're shocked or scared. So this gives a much more relaxed feeling there. I'm gonna use a little bit of white here because I originally made that iris a little bit too low, so I'm just going to bring it up a little. So that's kind of a nice deal. You can use it not only for highlights, but to cover up your errors, right? But then this part is brighter, so I'm going to go even lighter there. So that's the opposite. This edge of the eyelid is in shadow because it's facing down. This kind of waterline edge is facing up so it gets some light. Now as I'm finishing this up, let me know if you have any questions, but one of the things that I want you to notice is that there are not as many lines in this as you would think. My pencil marks are making lines, of course, but I didn't put a full outline all the way around the tear duct and all the way around the eye and all the way around the bottom. Um, you know, because it's really not as necessary as we think. And often putting lines on things makes things look flat because lines are invented by humans, really, you know. Um, so they're symbols. Lines are symbols for these things that we're trying to draw and we're trying to paint, but they're not what they actually look like. And I know I'm, I'm not working from a photograph here, I'm working from a painting, but those lines are not present in the original painting either. And there's a reason for that. Because, you know, you're trying to get away from symbolism if you're trying to do things realistically and move more towards what things look like and how they appear. And they don't actually appear to have lines most of the time. All right, you guys, what do you think? It's not exactly the same. I can see that my shape over here is a little bit different. You know, if I want to if I want to get this totally right, I'm going to maybe have to work on it some more, but but it looks like an eye, right? Okay, <laughs> so there we go. Um, I drew an eye that's kind of like this Rembrandt eye, and I've managed to retain 30 of you. Yay! So thank you for joining me. Um, this is going to be recorded, and it's going to be posted if you want to watch it again later or share it with your friends. And I am open to suggestions. Nobody knows how long 
some of this is going to be going on and I want to make sure that we all stay inspired and stay connected and have this community and I really want to thank Inner Urban Art House for working with me on this. It is just really um, an awesome thing for our, our entire community to have them in person and just all this programming that they're putting on virtually here. So check them out if you haven't seen all their programming. And I'm going to be here next week, same time, 5 p.m. Next week we're going to be going over how to draw hands, how I approach drawing hands. It'll be pretty similar, just basic materials. I think the week after that, we're gonna come back to the face and do noses because that's been requested. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed it and please post your work online and let me see what you did. Thank you.